Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. So this is a continuation, again, of the Mesilas Yesharim, which is called the Way of the Upright or the Path of the Just by the Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Mutsato, and this is from the Yafa edition from Art School. And this is what the Sefer looks like if you've never seen it, and I will have a link below. To art school so you could check out all that they offer and this is part number 73 still in chapter number 19 which is called the elements of Hasidus which means piety and continuing I split up this um, section that I started last week which was is called if I can just find that is called um, honoring Hashem by beautifying his mitzvot I decided to try to keep the videos a little bit shorter because um, they've been getting uh, a little long. And then, so last time we were talking about how we beautify the mitzvot, you know, by, um, you know, spending, uh, uh, not, not being cheap about what you have, what you, um, you know, uh, will, will buy in order to honor Hashem. So that's an important thing to remember. And uh, I was talking about the choices offering, you know, just different things. You could check back that video um, to get more uh, on that. Um, so now this part of that same section, is, is, it goes like this. So at the very beginning the to of the Torah, we see the importance of serving Hashem with the choices of materials. So here he brings an example. So in fact, we find in the episode of Cain and Hevel that Hashem frowns on those who serve Hashem with anything but the choices of their possessions. Hevel brought his offerings from the firstborn of his sheep and from the choices of them. That's from Beratius 4.4. 4. While Cain brought his offering from the inferior of the fruits of the land, according to the explanation of the sages of blessed memory from Beratius Rabbah 22.5. And the commentary says, The Torah merely records that Cain brought from the fruits of the land. It does not mention the quality of the produce that he brought. Since, however, it fails to mention that he brought a superior offering, as it does regarding Hevel, the sages of the Midrash infer that his offering was of inferior quality. That's from Mahar, Maharzu and Eshed Hanachalim. And Cain fell prey to the erroneous reasoning described above, the, that the quality of the offering makes no difference to the Creator, and that it is actually... And that it is actually belittling, belittling excuse me, to offer him a superior product as if he cares about the quality. That's from Rabbi Cheskel Sarna, Iunim, and Matnas Chelko. So, meaning he kind of was thinking, you know, um, doesn't matter because what does it matter to him anyway, right? Which he was wrong about, as we know. Okay, and he continues. And what happened to Kain and Hevel? The Torah states, um, same thing, gracious, uh, 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 four, four, and five. Uh, and Hashem turned to Hevel and to his offering, but to Cain and his offering, he did not turn. So now, moreover, it says about one who brings inferior animals as an offering to Hashem from Malachi 1.14. Cursed be the charlatan who has a superior ram in his flock, but vows and sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says Hashem, master of legions, and my name is awe-inspiring among the nations. And the commentary says, Thus, using poor quality materials to serve Hashem is not only wrong, but it is also cause for the service to be rejected, as in the case of Cain, and for the people, I'm sorry, for the person to be cursed if he has material of better quality, as in the Malachi verse. So meaning that that's what you need to do. Get, take the, give the superior the, the best that you have. Okay, and he continues. Other ways in which one must show proper reverence for mitzvot. The sages of blessed memory warned us to refrain from numerous things so that the mitzvot will not be contemptible to us. Commentary says, for example, when a non-domestic animal, which is called a chaya, or a bird is slaughtered, it is a mitzvah to cover the blood with earth, but this may not be done with one's feet. See Shabbos 22a. Acting in such a way, besides de demonstrating a lack of respect, can breed an attitude of contempt towards the mitzvah. Meaning, you know, don't use that and think that that's okay to do it that way. Okay, and he continues. They have even said from Megillah 32a, anyone who grasps a Torah scroll with his bare hands will be buried naked because of the contempt for the mitzvah that his practice shows. And the commentary says, Grasping the Torah scroll with bare hands refers to touching the parchment. 
It is permitted to touch the poles with bare hands. And then it says, see Mishnah Brewer 147.2. The sages do not mean literally that the person will be buried naked, but rather that when he dies, he will discover that he is bereft of the mitzvah he was performing while touching the Torah scroll with bare hands. For example, if he was studying Torah from a scroll while touching the parchment, he will receive no reward for that mitzvah. That's Gemara also um, with Tosfos. Thus, we see from here a remarkable concept. Performing a mitzvah without the requisite respect strips that mitzvah of its value. See, Derech Hashem 4, 2, 5. Okay, so that's important to know. Now, Ramchal continues. Ramchal returns to the subject of beautification of mitzvot, citing a paradigm for its proper fulfillment. The ceremony of bringing the Kurim up to Yerushalayim. And commentary says the Torah in Devarim 26, 1 through 11 commands that the first fruits of the seven species from each year's crop be brought up to Yerushalayim and given to a Kohen. It was customary to bring these fruits with great pomp as described in Tractate Bikurim chapter 3. Okay, and he continues. So the ceremony of bringing Bikurim up to Yerushalayim should serve as a guide for us to realize what is considered the proper beautification of mitzvot. For we have learned that the following in the Mishnah Bikurim 3.3. 3. As they carried Bikurim to Yerushalayim, the ox would walk ahead of them, its horns overlaid with gold, and a wreath of olive branches upon its head, etc. Commentary says an animal offering would be brought along with the Bikurim, see Bikurim 2.4. And when many people brought Bikurim together, they would pull their resources and purchase an ox. Uh, uh, Teshuvos Harashba 1.291. In honor of the mitzvah, they would overlay the ox's horns with gold and place a wreath of olive branches on its head. Among the trees indigenous to Eretz Yisrael, an olive tree is the choices, and its leaves are always fresh. That's from Rav. Okay, and uh, Ramchal continues. So also it is stated there, um, same place, what was that, uh, Bikurim uh, 3.8, the wealthy would bring their Bikurim in baskets of silver and gold, and the poor would bring them in baskets of peeled willow branches. Commentary says peeled willow branches are more beautiful than unpeeled ones from Teferi's Yisrael. Thus, even poor people who could not afford baskets of silver and gold would beautify their baskets to the best of their ability. Okay, Ramchal continues now. Um... Also, it is stated there, same, same place, Bikurim 3.10. There are three components to the Bikurim gift. The Bikurim themselves, the supplemental Bikurim, and the adornment of the Bikurim, etc. Commentary says, supplemental Bikurim were fruits of the same species as the Bikurim that were added to the basket. These were brought in order to make the Bikurim seem more substantial. That's uh, re Ben Malki Tzedek. I don't know what the, who that is, but that's what it says. Okay, uh, more substantial, which enhanced the beauty of the mitzvah. Adornment of the Bikurim refers to the common practice of decorating the baskets of Bikurim with beautiful fruit hanging around the outside of the basket. So those are two different things. There's a supplemental and adornment, so that those are different. So that was explanation of that. Okay, and he continues. Here we have an explicit example of how appropriate it is for us to add to the essential part of the mitzvah in order to beautify it. Commentary says, see Bikurim chapter 3 and Rambam, Hilchos Bikurim 416, where additional details of the Bikurim transportation ceremony are enumerated. Additionally, it says, it is clear from Ramchal that all these details of the Bikurim transportation procedure were manifestations of the general rule of Hidur Mitzvah, which means beautification of a mitzvah. Even though they were all external additions to the mitzvah rather than intrinsic beautifications of the mitzvah object itself. Although the mo most classical case of Hidur Mitzvah involves beautifying the mitzvah object itself, such as using a beautiful etrog or a beautiful Torah scroll, we do find that the concept of hedra mitzvah extends to external enhancements. For example, the Gemara in Shabbos 133b, which Ramchal cited above, lists wrapping the Torah scroll in beautiful silk as an example of hedra mitzvah. Okay, now he continues. And from here we should extrapolate to, the all, to all the other mitzvot in the Torah that they should be beautified. At times, the concept of honoring a mitzvah extends to the appearance of the perfor person performing it. So additionally, our sages said in Shabbos 10a, Before praying, Rava would don fine footwear and then pray. He said an explanation of this practice, Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. That's from Amos 4.12. And the commentary says when, when praying, one quote, meets Hashem, as Ramchal explained above, and this encounter calls for special preparation. Rava prepared for it by donning special clothing. See Shulchan Aruch Archaim 98.4, where this practice is encouraged, okay? Also, and now he continues, also our sages of blessed memory said in Barashas Rabbah 65.16, regarding the verse, Rivka then took the precious garments of Asaph, her older son, and clothed Yaakov, her younger son. Barashas 
And the commentary says, Rivka clothed Yaakov in Esav's garments so that Yaakov would not be identified when he impersonated Esav and went to serve his father Yitzchak and received the blessing from him. These, quote, precious garments were the ones Esav usually wore when serving his father. Also from Bracious Rabbah, okay? And the Ramchal continues, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, All my days I served my father, but I did not serve him even one hundredth as respectfully as Esav served his father Yitzchak. I would serve my father while wearing soiled garments, but when setting out to travel, I went in clean garments. Esav, on the other hand, when he served his father, did not serve him except while clothed in royal garments. Now, if such is the appropriate attire for performing the service of flesh and blood, of a flesh and blood human being, then certainly regarding the king of all kings, the holy one, blessed is he, it is true. That one who stands before him to pray should properly uh, wear dignified clothing, and one who sits before him should come Port himself like one who sits before a great human king. And the commentary says, In fact, proper attire for prayer, as defined by Allah, is determined by what is considered appropriate attire for appearing before a person of stature in that particular locale. It's Shulchan Aruch or Chaim 91.5 and Mishnah Brewer, um, I think that's paragraph 11. It has a certain uh, a, a symbol or something. I don't know what that means, but maybe that is so. And then the, uh, it also says that the Imre MS, which is Rav Avram Mordechai of Gur, once had to meet a high-ranking government official. And in his honor, the rabbi, the rabbi wore a nicer hat than he was accustomed to wear during the week. After the meeting was over and the Imre MS was about to pray the Mincha service, his attendant brought him his regular hat. Chas v'shalom, he explained. If the honor of a mere mortal I was wearing a nicer hat, then surely I will not take it off when I approach the king of all kings. That's from Elena Volume 5, page 330. So that ends the section here. I'm going to stop. So you see that's important, not only for the mitzvah, for the person himself, that to know that when he's standing before Hashem, Lahavdil, he's standing before a human king, you know, you want to look your, your best. So, And I hope and pray they will all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMegdash. Amen and thanks for watching.